You're listening to an Airwave Media Podcast. Get cash for clothes at Plato's Closet in North Charleston and West Ashley. It's so easy. Recycle, earn cash, repeat. We pay cash on the spot for your trendy, gently used clothing, shoes, and accessories. At Plato's Closet, we buy all seasons, all day, every day. It's time to clean out your closet and cash in. Bring in your denim, graphic tees, athletic wear, shoes, handbags, and more. Sell your styles to Plato's Closet for cash. Then do it again. Plato's Closet, located in West Ashley on Sam Rittenberg Boulevard and North Charleston on Rivers Avenue. It's a long way to Tipperary, it's a long way to go, it's a long way to Tipperary, to the sweetest girl I know, goodbye Piccadilly. Hello everyone and welcome to History of the Great War episode 172. As we enter the autumn once again, I thought I would let everybody know that I'm once again going to be attending the annual symposium at the World War I Museum and Memorial in Kansas City, Missouri in the first week of November. So if you're attending, let me know. First beer, as always, is on me. Or if you're just in the Kansas City area and would like to meet um, at a restaurant or something on Saturday, November 3rd, let me know. We'll set something up. It could be fun. This week, the American attacks in the Meuse-Argonne offensive continue, but we will also take a bit of a break from the larger story to focus on a much smaller one. When the attacks would continue in the first week of October, there would once again be many failures, but there would be some small successes. One of these small successes would be an attack by a battalion of American troops. They would be so successful that they would eventually be surrounded by German forces. Over the next six days, the battalion would beat off repeated German counterattacks until they were relieved on October 8th. After the war, the battalion's commander, Major Whittlesley, would receive the Medal of Honor, and the story of the surrounded troops would become somewhat famous. I was first introduced to the story way back in 2001, when A&E released a TV movie on the story, back when A&E made movies I liked to watch. Before we get to that story of the Lost Battalion, though, we need to discuss the planning done by Pershing and Foch that would chart the course for the next phase of the Meuse-Argonne Offensive. Pershing and the Americans had pulled back on their attacks at the end of September, but they hoped to continue attacks in October and the French wanted to help. There were two big problems that would have to be solved if the American and French troops wanted to make progress. The first would be finding a way to take care of the German artillery fire that was falling on them from the German artillery positions on the east side of the River Meuse, and the second was the general lack of progress made on the American left in the Argonne. For both of these problems, the French general Wagon, uh, Foch's chief of staff, believed he had a solution. The first problem, the artillery fire from the heights of the Meuse, was the easiest. The French proposed that the attack be extended to the east bank of the river. This attack would be executed by the French 17th Corps, which would need to be augmented by a few American divisions, with both groups of troops being placed under Pershing's command. Pershing was definitely on board with this expansion. He could see the problems that the artillery was causing and agreed with the solution to fix it. For the problem on the American left, the French then proposed that the French 2nd Army be placed in between the French 4th Army and the Americans. This would place it right in the Argonne and ready to try to continue the advance there. Once again, it would require a few American divisions, probably the 72nd, uh, the 77th and the 28th, which were already in that part of the front. The key difference here was that these troops would be taken out of Pershing's control and put under French control. It was at this point that Foch and Weygand lost Pershing's support. As always, Pershing was very touchy about losing control of any American troops, and he believed that this plan meant the dismemberment of the American First Army at a moment when its elements are striving for success under the direction of American command. Foch, having been down this road before with Pershing, was quick to relinquish this point. However, he did insist that Pershing, quote, that your attacks start without delay, and that once begun, they be continued without any interruptions such as those that have already arisen. 
Pershing took this advice to heart and planned to launch a renewed attack along his entire 12-mile front. He would fall back on a very simplistic model for these operations, saying that, quote, the thing to do was to drive forward with all possible force. While this was all well and good, it did not resolve the problems that the Americans were still going to have in trying to push through the heart of the German defenses. The Kreimhild Stalag still stood before them, and Golfowitz had heavily reinforced these defenses. American intelligence believed that there were up to 26 Germans and one Austrian division in these defenses, with many more in reserve. The Germans also knew that the Americans were going to try again. Multiple prisoners were captured on October 3rd, and they reported that the general offensive would begin the next day. They even outlined their unit's objectives. The defenders would be fully prepared for what came next. But before the general attack was begun, there would be smaller efforts throughout the first few days of October. These were generally smaller attacks designed to slightly alter the line and give better positions for that larger attack that would be in the future. One of these would be launched by the American 77th Division, and that's where our story of the Lost Battalion begins. On October 2nd, the commander of the 77th Division, Major General Alexander, would inform Brigadier General Evan Johnson that he was to launch an attack. Johnson was to take his 154th Brigade and attack the German positions in front of him in support of a French attack on his left and another American attack on his right. Alexander was adamant that Johnson launch these attacks on the specified date, saying that if he could not, then Alexander would find somebody who could. The goal of the 154th Brigade was a ridge to the north of the Charlevoix Mill Road. There had been some previous attempts to reach this position, and the 307th Regiment had actually reached it the day before and then had been pushed back. The 1st Battalion of the 308th Regiment, part of the 154th Brigade, was commanded by Major Whittlesey. His unit was responsible for taking a set of German positions on a hill on the way to the Charlevoix uh, Mill Road. Previous attacks had shown that these positions would be a tough nut to crack, but some scouts had reported that there might be a better way. A ravine on the east side of the hill was present that might allow the American troops to slip past the worst of the German defenses. This would be the path that Whittlesey would take when the attack went forward. The men of the 77th Division had been in action since September 26th. During that time, they had taken serious casualties. Many regiments had been reduced to the size of battalions and battalions to companies. There had been many reinforcements brought in, which resulted in something of a cultural clash. Originally, many of the units had been made up of troops from New York City, primarily from Brooklyn. The replacements that had arrived were from Wyoming, and many had just arrived at the front. It would be said that many of these had not fired a rifle and never seen a grenade. They had no idea of target designation or had to be told how, where, and when to shoot. Regardless of how well the units meshed together, they were about to attack and so they got ready the best that they could. Ration parties arrived right before the attack on September 2nd and quickly passed out a day's worth of food. Not all the units received these supplies and part of the eventually lost battalion would go forward with no additional rations at all. Ammunition was in a reasonable state, with many troops having their allotted 200 rounds of ammunition, although grenades and machine gun ammunition was in short supply. Most importantly, these troops had not been fully off the line for over a week, and therefore rest had been hard to come by. It would not be any easier after the attack had begun. When Whittlesey and his men attacked, they found that they were not facing as much German resistance as expected. There were a few German troops, especially snipers, but the Americans were still able to advance quite quickly. By mid-afternoon, they had moved up the ravine and were on the western side of the ridge, Ridge 198, approaching the Charlevoix Mill Road. Whittlesey ordered his men up the ridge and then dug in on the western slope. The hope was that being on this side of the ridge would provide good protection from German artillery fire. There was also good cover here, with plenty of trees and a thick undergrowth. The American troops were deployed in an oval shape, with a formation about 300 yards wide by 60 deep. The Americans dug in with rifle and machine gun pits, and up to this point, everything was going pretty standard, and the Americans were ready to hold their positions until more troops arrived. While moving forward, Willsey had left runners every 200 yards to allow for contact to be maintained to the rear. Everything was going according to plan. Sure, there were some reports of German troops on the left and the right, especially on the left, where sniper activity was the heaviest, but they were supposed to be handled by French troops advancing there 
you know, really soon. It'll be fine. But as time went on and no contact was made with the French troops on the left or the American troops on the right at all, Whittlesey and the Americans became concerned. What Whittlesey could not have known at this point was that the French attack on the left had completely failed. Instead of advancing, the French had withdrawn in a pretty poor state. And then on the right, the American division that was supposed to advance was quickly bogged down. Whittlesey's advance was the only thing that was really going according to plan here, and when Johnson found out about it, he decided to push forward with that success. He moved a battalion of the 307th Regiment over um, to then advance and the same ravine that Whittlesey had used, but this move took time. By the time that it started to get dark, the first company of this battalion, Company K under the command of Captain Nelson Holderman, had arrived. Holderman would bring with him 79 men, adding to Whittlesey's 475. These 79 men would be the last reinforcements before the battalion was surrounded. The one truth about human history is that change is inevitable. But the one thing that has never changed is that humans need food to survive. There are many ways to get that food. But one of the easiest ones is Factor. Factor delivers ready-to-eat meals right to your door. All you have to do is heat them up and dig in. In two minutes, you can be eating tasty keto or vegan options or any of their 35 options that they have available every week. So you can choose maybe the cheesy garden herb chicken, maybe the Santa Fe green chili beef skillet, or perhaps the Caribbean spiced tofu. It is all delicious And if you have a bit of a sweet tooth, Factor still has you covered with a wide range of snack and smoothie options. Chocolate mocha cheesecake, snickerdoodle macaroons, any of that sound good? And don't worry, even the tasty stuff is dietitian approved. Head over to factormeals.com slash GW50 and use code GW50 to get 50% off. That's code GW50 at factormeals.com slash GW50 to get 50% off. Get cash for clothes at Plato's Closet in North Charleston in West Ashley. It's so easy. Recycle, earn cash, repeat. We pay cash on the spot for your trendy, gently used clothing, shoes, and accessories. At Plato's Closet, we buy all seasons, all day, every day. It's time to clean out your closet and cash in. Bring in your denim, graphic tees, athletic wear, shoes, handbags, and more. Sell your styles to Plato's Closet for cash. Then, do it again. Plato's Closet, located in West Ashley on Sam Rittenberg Boulevard and North Charleston on Rivers Avenue. The Germans would close in and cut off Whittlesey's unit early on October 3rd by moving in behind it from the left and the right. They would then close off the end of the ravine that had been used for the advance. There would be 554 men trapped inside. It was soon apparent to the men within the pocket that they were surrounded, and in the afternoon the German harassment began in earnest. Grenades were a constant nuisance. They were thrown down on the American positions from the German positions in basically every direction. One of the soldiers would say that, quote, There were long periods of time when all one did was lie there and hope nothing made a direct hit on one of our particular funk holes. In the evening, the Germans made their first assault on the American positions, with attacks on both the left and the right. Fortunately, this is exactly where Whittlesey had positioned his machine guns, and these were able to beat back the German attack with somewhat ease. By the time that the Germans' attacks were over, though, the Americans had used up all of their grenades and were very short of machine gun ammunition. During the day, Whittlesey had released three carrier pigeons to try and get information about a situation out to the officers behind the front. It was his only method of communication, but he only had so many birds. In just this one day of fighting, 25% of the American troops had become casualties, and they were soon out of water. There were two areas where water could be found, a small brook and a larger stream, but of course the Germans were watching these areas closely. Every person who tried to get water from these sources was wounded or killed, and so Whittlesey had to post guards to make sure nobody tried it during the day. Even at night, there would be heavy German fire preventing water from being retrieved easily. Reports of the situation within the pocket slowly filtered back up the chain of command. There was concerns that if the troops surrendered, there would be a serious morale penalty to pay, and so plans began to circulate about how to try and launch relief efforts. 
In the pocket on the morning of October 4th, the situation continued to deteriorate. The men were now out of food, water was almost a forgotten dream, the wounded as always suffered the worst from these shortages. Whittlesey used two of his last three pigeons during the late morning and early afternoon. He honestly had no idea if these bits of information were getting through, but he hoped that somebody on the outside knew what was happening. Throughout all of this, the Germans were constantly harassing the trapped Americans, with small attacks being launched and constant grenade, trench mortar fire, and just general harassment. A bit before 3 p.m. in the afternoon, artillery fire started dropping near the American positions. It started to the south of the troops, but then it began to close in. Whittlesey would say that, quote, increasing in intensity, the barrage crept down the slope, crossed, crossing the marshy bottom of the ravine where it hurled mud and brush into the air and settled directly on our position, end quote. The problem was, this was not German artillery fire, but instead American, and it was dropping right on the American positions. With no other recourse, Whittlesey attached a message to his last carrier pigeon, named Cher Ami. It read, We are along the road parallel to 276.4. Our own artillery is dropping a barrage directly on us. For heaven's sake, stop it. When the bird was released, it did not immediately fly away. Instead, it perched itself on a nearby tree. With artillery fire landing all around, the officers threw things at the bird to try to get it to fly away. And eventually, a private had to climb the tree and shake the branches. When the bird arrived behind the lines, it had been shot, blinded in one eye, and it would lose a leg but it had delivered its message, and fire would stop at around 4.20 p.m. Jeremy would survive and would become a hero of the 77th Division. She is currently displayed in the Smithsonian Museum in Washington, D.C. News about the battalion started to spread around the American units on October 4th, with it being a prime topic of conversation all along the line. In the grand scheme of the American war effort, one battalion eh, really didn't matter. 500 men was a tiny fraction of the total American attacking force, but due to its symbolism, it could not be ignored. This concern rose even to the height of Pershing himself, and it would play a role in the planning for future attacks in the coming days. Up to this point, the attacks in October had been pretty much a failure, with October 4th having been another day of disappointment. Along the length of the front, German morale was still flying high, though, with Galwitz reporting that, quote, the men related with pride how tank attacks had been resisted, reporting that many tanks were destroyed by artillery and machine guns. One lieutenant blew up with his guns not less than three of those monstrous tanks, if current rumors meant anything. Our flyers, too, gave a very good account of themselves. They not only brought in important information in regard to the development of the fighting, but also succeeded in preventing the enemy from observing movements in our rear. The whole 5th Army felt in the best of humor, on account of having completely repulsed a superior opponent. End quote. Early on October 5th, American artillery fire began to once again fall near the trapped American troops. It started behind them and slowly moved forward, and just as it looked like it might be a repeat of the day before, the American fire jumped the trapped American troops and began falling on the German positions above them by the road. This would signal the first major American attempt to reach the cutoff troops. The men of the Lost Battalion could hear firing and fighting happening behind them, with German machine guns featuring heavily. However, the firing never seemed to get any closer, and instead by the middle of the afternoon, it seemed to be getting further away. The attack had failed, and the troops were in for another lonely night. On that evening, the temperature dropped, adding cold and rain to the misery of the trapped troops. With the first relief attempt defeated, the Germans decided to make another effort to destroy the pocket of American troops. In this attack, they would bring forward flamethrowers, and they would make more of an attempt to push the Americans out. There was becoming some time pressure on the Germans as well. The Americans were finally starting to advance in some areas of the front, and soon the units around the trapped Americans might have to completely abandon their positions. Before the flamethrowers could arrive, a few Americans would be captured. They were what was left of eight soldiers that had moved down to a spring near the American positions, where they waited and watched. Their goal was to find the Germans and hopefully kill one and get some food. They had just gotten ready to move when they were hit by German machine gun fire. Five of the eight were killed instantly and the rest were wounded. One of the prisoners could still walk, and so the Germans asked him to carry a message back to the trapped American troops. This would be Private Hollingshead. 
He was given bread, cigarettes, a cane, and a white flag on a stick, and most importantly, a message to give to his commanding officer. When the message was delivered to Whittlesey, it read, quote, The suffering of your wounded men can be heard over here in the German lines, and we are appealing to your humane sentiments to stop. A white flag shown by one of your men will tell us that you agree with these conditions. Please treat Private Lowell R. Hollingshead, the bearer of this message, as an honorable man. He is quite a soldier. We envy you, the German commanding officer. End quote. The note was passed around among the officers, and when everyone had read it, Captain McMurdy would later say that, quote, There was a good smile all around among the crowd of us, because first, we knew that the Germans felt that they could not take us, and secondly, the fact that they had been trying to wipe us out every day since we had been in the position, and then had written a note stating that they wanted us to surrender in the name of humanity. With the failure of the Americans to answer, the Germans moved into their position for their next attack. The attack would be smaller than the Germans had hoped, and there would only be a few flamethrowers available. When it did go forward, when the fighting would be intense, but the Americans were able to hit the slow-moving flamethrower troops before they were able to cause too much damage. Once again, the German attack had been thrown back, just barely, but it would prove to be the last one. The reason that these were the final attacks is that the Germans were forced to abandon their positions and fall back. This is due to uh, developments on another part of the front that we will talk about next week. This meant that soon the Americans were advancing towards the trapped troops. At 7 p.m. on October 7th, Whittlesey and McMurdy were sitting in a foxhole when a runner appeared from the right. He reported that there were American troops and they wanted to speak with the commanding officer. The lost battalion had been relieved. When the relieving troops arrived, they found men that were starving, thirsty, and barely able to stay awake. As much food as possible was passed around to the men, and then they slept while the new arrivals took over their positions. It would not be until the next day that medical officers and more supplies arrived, and then the troops began to move to the rear. 194 men would walk out, 144 would be taken out on stretchers, the rest, 216, had been killed. One of the soldiers that would take over this part of the front would say that while they were evacuating, quote, I couldn't say anything to them. There was nothing to say anyway. It made your heart lump in your throat just to look at them. Their faces told the whole story of their fight. It had been a harrowing experience for the troops, and they were also now somewhat famous, along with the pigeon. Whittlesey, McMurdy, and Holderman would all receive the Congressional Medal of Honor for their actions during the first week of October. Whittlesey's Medal of Honor citation would read, quote, Although cut off for five days from the remainder of his division, Major Whittlesey maintained his position, which he had reached under orders received for an advance, and held his command, consisting originally of 46 officers and men of the 308th Infantry and Company K of the 307th Infantry, together in the face of superior numbers of the enemy during the five days. Major Whittlesey and his command were thus cut off, and no rations or other supplies reached him, in spite of determined efforts which were made by his division. On the fourth day, Major Whittlesey received from the enemy a written proposition to surrender, which he treated with contempt, although he was at that time out of rations and had suffered the loss of about 50% in killed and wounded of his command, and was surrounded by the enemy. End quote. So with the story of the Lost Battalion now at an end, I wanted to bring something up. So throughout the war, there are countless stories just like that of Whittlesey and his men, maybe not lost, but similar sort of heroic stories on both sides of the front that we don't really cover here on the podcast. Our episodes just aren't detailed enough. But if you have one that you really like, um, that you think is really interesting, Let me know. As we move into a post-Versailles world in 2019, there will be opportunities where I can discuss these sorts of really detailed stories uh, occasionally on the show in between other narrative episodes of the post-war world. Thank you for listening, and I hope you will join me next episode as we take the story of the Meuse-Argonne Offensive to completion on a day, November 11th, 1918, which is obviously not important at all in our story. It's just a random day in November.